All right, All right, I think we're ready here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Chaucer's virtual author discussion with Joyce Chopra, the author of Lady Director, Adventures in Hollywood, Television, and Beyond. My name is Michael Takeuchi, and I'm the events coordinator at Chaucer's Bookstore a 48-year-old independent bookstore located in Santa Barbara, California. Well, tonight's event will be our last of the year, so we can concentrate our efforts on the holiday season. We will back, be back online in store events in the new year. It looks like I'm having a problem with my audio here, so... We're going to try to do this a little bit differently. To check out our upcoming opening events, please go to our website at chaucersbooks.com. Okay. Sorry about this. I think that's better. All right, without further ado, let's bring out our author, Joyce Chopra. Tonight, I am so pleased to welcome Heiner Engelmaker and now author, Joyce Chopra, who is Zooming from Virginia. Wow. Michael, there's something really wrong with your audio. You're doubling. I'm, I'm kind of wondering, wondering why. why. It was fine before. Let's see is, is, is mine okay? Yours is great. Oh, well, why don't I start, while you're trying to fix yours, I'll read the prologue to my book. Okay, go for it. Okay, I have it here below me in larger print than the book. Okay, prologue. <clears throat> when I was about 22 or so, I purchased a Bolex film camera and never once dared to use it. It just sat on a tripod in the corner of my room, staring at me reproachfully. Becoming a movie director had taken a firm grip on my imagination, but I had the vaguest idea how one managed to do that. There weren't any film schools that I knew of and even more problematic. I couldn't picture myself in the director's role since I'd never seen a movie directed by a woman. Even the film history books that I collected to educate myself never mentioned a single one. It didn't strike me as odd. It was 1958 and that's the way the world was. I would have been astonished if anyone had told me that a French woman exactly my age, Alice Guy, G-Y, was the first person to direct a one minute movie with actors in 1896 in Paris, or that 20 years later, an American woman, Lois Weber, would become the first person to direct a feature length film, an adaptation of The Merchant of Venice for the newly formed Universal Studios in Hollywood. I would have been equally amazed to be told that another woman I never heard of, Dorothy Arzner, directed major films all through the 30s, starring the likes of Catherine Hepburn and Joan Crawford. Hold on, I gotta turn the page. Having <laughs> begun her own transition into the new world of talkies along with the silent movie star, Clara Bow. Miss Bow's fear of microphones was so intense that it prompted Arson to invent the boom mic by attaching a microphone to a fishing pole that followed the actress around the set where she couldn't see it. But none of these accomplishments would be recognized until many years later when scholars began to uncover women's roles in the early days of movie making. It's frustrating to think that I knew nothing of their work at a time when it would have helped me to feel less insane to think of such a career for myself. But even if I had known that other women had once been successful film directors, I would have been dismayed that their success didn't last. By the 1940s, when Hollywood became a very corporate world, not one woman could be found sitting in the director's chair except for the actress, Ida Lupino. 
who survived by becoming her own, by forming her own production company and hiring herself. I like like Lapito, excuse me, like Lapino, I too had started my own business, Club 47, a folk music venue in Harvard Square that drew a devoted audience from the day it opened. But once the club was up and running, I became restless and unable to stop myself from obsessing about making movies. I even started a weekly film series. On the nights we were close, I could see films I had only read about and then watch them a second time to take notes on how they were shot. In a way, these private viewings were harmful. The more I learned, the more convinced I became that I was deluding myself. How could I possibly think I could be part of such magic? I also doubted that I had the courage to leave my familiar world behind, to venture into the great unknown. It took a year, but obsession finally won out. I gave my treasured Bolux camera to a friend who I hope would actually use it and sold my share in the club to my partner, Paula. With $1,500 in my wallet and a backpack, I set out to find my way. That's most wow. of the like, Yeah. That's incredible. You know, they didn't it, write- It just- Go ahead. Actually, these film history books weren't written until the 1990s. It's not, it's mm -hmm. so beyond when I started. It's extraordinary. It is. If, if I may introduce Joyce properly, um, Joyce has written and directed a number of films, including the, the Sundance hit Smooth Talk, which is the winner of the Grand Jury Prize. Um, she's directed an Amy thriller with the lady in question with the lovable Gene Wilder. She's received American Film Festival Blue Ribbons, uh, Cine Golden Eagle Awards for numerous documentaries, including That Our Children Will Not Die. It's about primary health care in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. The autobiographical Joyce at 34, which we hope to talk a little bit about, it's in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Arts. Many of these films, including Smooth Talk, which we will talk about, can be viewed on the Criterion channel right now. So please have a look. Uh, but tonight's book, A Lady Director of Ventures in Hollywood Television and Beyond, is from City Lights, the wonderful publisher, as well as bookstore. Shout out to my friends up in San Francisco. So Joyce, thank you again and, and welcome. It, you had such an amazing career. But to start, you didn't, you wanted to do films, but you didn't really start doing films. You, you were a club owner of all things yes. early in your life. Oh, well, you would like to tell you a little about that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I graduated from Brandeis University in 1957 with a degree in comparative literature. I didn't want to go mm -hmm. to graduate school. I wanted to be an actress. First, and I went to a very okay. wonderful acting school in New York, the Neighborhood Playhouse. But I left, I was there almost a whole year, but for personal reasons, which I will put aside now, I didn't stay. So I went back up to Cambridge because I knew that area and was working as a waitress. <laughs> it's the typical job carrying those heavy metal, can I do it? Yeah, heavy metal yeah. trays. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, and I ran into a classmate and, and she hated her job. And I said, forget all this. We'll start our own business. We'll, and so it was going to be, I, I'd spent a junior year in Paris. And I said, we'll start a French cafe. And we'll have racks those in cafe. They'll have wooden bars and newspapers will hang from them. We'll have the Figaro, the this, you know. The mm -hmm. And so we actually found a shop very close to Harvard Square and rented it, renovated it. It, was, it used to be a used furniture store. And oh, just a few days before we opened, a friend said, who was a jazz pianist at Harvard, a senior said, I'll pay for your opening. Wonderful. Well, it, the music was such an amazing thing in Harvard Square. We were jammed from the first day. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and we had the Berkeley School of Music was just across the river. So we had a stream of wonderful musicians. And then after about a year, a very pleasant fellow came in one evening and he said, would you audition the daughter of a co my colleague at MIT? What does she do? <laughs> An instrument. He said, no, no, she's a folk singer. And my reaction oh. was, 
we do not do folk music here. We are a jazz club. <laughs> I mentioned sincerely, I'd fallen in love with jazz. Uh, so we, he said, well, at least listen to her on a night you're closed, which is Monday nights. And this girl with long black, black hair came in and carrying her guitar. And she went up to our little stage, which was about a foot higher than the regular one. And she started to sing. And I almost fell off my seat because it was Joan Baez. And her oh voice is God. so big and so so original. So of course we hired her to sing on our slow nights to start with, which was Wednesday, Thursday. Then <laughs> we switched from the, she went to sat Friday, Saturday, and, but, and she sang there for quite a while. And because of my jazz, there was a wonderful jazz club. Um, oh God, I'm blanking on the name in Boston. Anyway, my partner and I, we used to go there at night after we closed the Club 47, which was our name. And somebody mm -hmm. pointed out a guy sitting there with no expression on his face, uh, Albert Grossman. And I was told he was the manager of Odetta, who was a very popular singer. This is, we're talking about late 50s, 58. And I went up to him and I said, we have this great girl singing at Apple. You really got to come. He showed no interest, but he showed up the next night. He didn't talk. He didn't come in. He didn't talk to me. He didn't talk to me or Paula. He sat there like a Buddha, no expression, and he left. No goodbye, nothing. And then he he got in touch with Joan, obviously, because in a week she had left, and he ah. took her to the. He took her to the. He was running the Newport Folk Festival. Oh. And so uh, I, I'm sure somebody else would have. She would have found her way. She was such a great talent. And is still a great talent. Anyway, that's Joan. Oh, wow. That's interesting that's my story. Club. Yeah. But you you were doing a club, and but obviously you, you were on to bigger and better things. So I'm wondering if you can tell a little bit about what happened right after that. And, you know, I mean, how you after, transitioned after I, to become... Oh, not easily. Uh, I first, because I love living in Paris, I think every young person or older mm -hmm. person would, I, I went back there hoping to get a job with a French film producer. And I somebody had given me some connections. So I had three or four names and I got to Paris. And, and I mean, the first guy, you know, after five was touching my breasts, and the next put his arm around my waist. It was miserable, every one of them felt free, mm -hmm. but I, I was just there for the taking. And I left after about oh, less than a month, completely broke. And I went back to New York. I never thought of going to Hollywood. I mean, it mm -hmm. never occurred to me that there weren't any women there. And I, I really, I had a long list again of go to this place. I first tried, we, in those days, I'll be an old timer. There were three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS. There were no mm -hmm. channels, no, no cable. So I said, well, I don't like television, but I don't know where else to. So I went to all three networks, hoping I'd get a job as a, as a, I told them I wanted to be a director and they thought I was crazy. And that didn't work out. And I went down mm -hmm. the list and I finally, somebody sent me, this again is just great luck to these people who had just, basically invented the handheld camera that is now so common because this, it was when transistors were finally available to put in cameras and tape recorders. And it meant mm -hmm. they were lightweight. You, you didn't have, you didn't need, didn't need a tripod. You just follow anywhere. You're all so used to looking at it now, but truly until I landed in this place in 1960, cameras were on tripods and sound equipment was bulky, you had to wheel it along the floor. And I walked into a revolution. It's called cinema verite or direct cinema or whatever you want to call it. And I was lucky they hired me as an apprentice. Did you realize, you know, the innovations that they're making at the time? Were you able to appreciate that? Or do you just think that people were just figuring things out? I have to say, you know, to start with, I didn't really want to take the go for this job because I wanted to make really? fiction films. No, I, I hardly wow. had ever seen a documentary. I didn't even know where you would see them. 
in movie theaters, uh, there would be the news of the week. Uh, da -da 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 -da. The reels, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I I could read a little portion of that. Do I have that somewhere here? Yes. Yeah, please do. Okay. Yeah. Let me find this. But uh, I won't read all. You know, it, it could take up our whole time here. Okay. Okay. After that miserable experience, I'm referring to Paris and all that happened there. Mm -hmm. I was back in Manhattan within a week, dead broke. What If it wasn't for the generosity of friends who offered up their couch for me to sleep on, I might have wound up sleeping on a bench in Central Park. With little choice but to push on or return to Cambridge with my tail drooping between my legs, I somehow summoned up my resolve to once more find a way into the film business, even if I had a first tour into television. And I talk about what I just uh, write about, CB, going to the networks, and that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it was so... Uh, okay. I then remembered that Al Cap, the creator of the popular comic strip Lil Labner, an acquaintance of mine in Cambridge, might be able to help. When I call Al, he said he would be delighted to assist and suggested we meet in his uh, apartment, East Side apartment. Mm. I was excited when I arrived. Al was famous, knew everybody in the world, and thinking of him as a friend, I wasn't on my guard. He cordially invited me to sit on his couch, offered me a glass of wine, and faster than one of his cartoon characters could yell, wham, his hands fall over my body as he tried to force his tongue into my mouth. I still remember the smell oh. of his pomaded hair. I doubt I said goodbye as I fled. After three, more, after three months of feeling more and more wretched with each passing day as each lead led to nowhere, I was just about ready to give up. I almost didn't knock on the door of the last person on my list, a Mr. Will, Willard Van Dyke. Frankie wouldn't regard me as just another tasty tidbit. Okay, that goes on to, he, he says, I know a bunch of crazy people, you'll fit right in. And he sent me over to this place that I'm talking about with D.A. Okay. Penny Baker and Lee Cock, and that then the story goes on from there. No, but mm -hmm. I, I, when I came in, this Penny Baker, he was very harried. He had no time to talk to me. He, you know, I said, "Oh, I'm dying to make movies. I'm dying to work for you." Whatever nonsense I said. He said, "Here, sit down. We just made this movie, uh, and it's original." So he leaves the room, and I'm all alone in a room, and I'm watching a film called Primary which was the first film shot using this equipment. And it was about John F. Kennedy and Hubert Humphreys. Uh, it was a mm -hmm. primary fight in Wisconsin. It's a half hour and it's finished. And I enjoyed it. And then Penny Bay come, comes in and he says, well, what do you think? And I didn't know what to say because I didn't know why it was original. <laughs> it was normal to me because that's how in fiction films, people, camera yeah. moves with people. Mm -hmm. So I, he hired me anyway. I must have said something <laughs> reasonable, and yeah. uh, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. What well, you you did work with uh, the inauguration, correct? The inauguration of John F. John F. Kennedy's inauguration. Ah, you may ask. Well, that'll be brief to read. Yes, I went to Kennedy's inauguration. Well, I'll just tell about it. No, Kennedy so appreciated this movie primary that he invited yeah. this crew to come and be with him on inauguration day. And then the secret service said, no way, you know, this is not gonna happen. So we went anyway to film different people. And I was assigned with a cameraman, Ricky Leacock, to following uh, a Senator mm -hmm. Hubert Humphrey. And I put a wireless mic around his neck. It was freezing, the snow had blanketed the city, but, and I was wearing what women wore then, uh, I was wearing, Mm -hmm. Nylon stockings and pumps and a little skirt, you know, and a jacket. I was very ladylike looking. And mm -hmm. there were no, you couldn't buy boots in the city because the snow had just suddenly come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was wonderful. I even got to uh, hear Kennedy actually say, do not ask what, do not ask what, 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 what is the line? Do not ask what you can, what for can you country. do for your country? Yeah. Yes, do yes. not ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Yeah. Sure. You were there live. I was there live. Yeah, but Robert Frost read poetry. It was the first time anybody read poetry at an inauguration. Yeah, it was the so what, first. 
Can you share what your assignment was in oh. that particular film, if you don't mind? In the what, when you say my assignment, describe what it was. Um, what your your particular job for that film was, if you could read yes. a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, they never actually cut it. They never made a film out of that day's footage. Uh, <sighs> it didn't. It didn't hold. I I don't know what happened to the footage, but I we had a wonderful time. Uh, you you were yeah. you were with um, Hubert Humphrey, correct? Yes, hold on a minute. Let me see if I can find it. Talk among yourselves. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. I'll just back up a little bit. Within hours, an unforeseen storm blanketed Washington, D.C. in snow, with eight inches falling by evening. As befitted a professional working girl, I was wearing a skirt, nylon stockings, and low heel pumps. Every pair of boots in the city had sold out instantly. But still running on pure adrenaline, I didn't feel the cold slapping at my bare legs as Ricky and I took our places in the press stand, opposite where the grandees of both parties were seated to watch the parade of the states go by. I put a wireless mic on Hubert Humphrey and was privy to every comment he and his wife Muriel made to each other. Mm. After a short while, Muriel, the bundle up to her chin and furs to keep out the chill, began to mumble complaints as the parade dragged on. Daddy, I'm so cold, can't we go home? To which the senator patiently replied, no mommy, not until our state goes by. But Minnesota may be another hour away, she moaned. Joe Kennedy was seated not far off in the front row. And when his son, the president elect, rode by in his open limousine, the proud papa stood up and let out a savage whoop with such unabashed exultation that I felt I was witnessing something that not meant to be seen by strangers. Senator Humphrey, ever the gentleman, in spite of his primary loss to Kennedy, said to no one in particular, my, oh my, Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy must be awfully proud of their boy today. <laughs> anyway, it goes on to describe what it was like at the mall in Kennedy. You know, Yes, do not, the, and tell my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It was the first day of Camelot. Remember that? Well, you young, you don't remember all that. But, no, um, it's a little before my time, it. but it's wonderful. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Just to be part of that. And um, you, you spent a little time doing documentary work, including. Yourself, oh, yeah. you, you, you yourself were in front of the camera for a little while, correct? Uh, with you mean with Joyce, Joyce thirty four? Thirty four. Well, yeah. yeah, I, I, I went on to make films of my own documentaries. Mm -hmm. I had, mm -hmm. I, I, I'd sort of given up on the idea that I would ever make fiction films. Things were not getting better in the sixties, and then I fell in love and got married to Tom Cole, a writer. Mm -hmm. And we had a baby. And what year would this be? Well, she was born in 71. So in April, early 71, 1971, a friend. Oh, I had I had taken on a job to do a documentary about a, a, an experiment, an experimental private school, a Montessori school, so that I would be sure to have a job after I gave birth so that I could hold mm -hmm. on to this concept of myself that I'm a film person not just a mother, yeah. or not only a mother. Mm -hmm. And a friend suggested when I was about eight months pregnant, she said, you know, you're in a very unique position because you're a filmmaker to do a film about whether you and your mother's relationship will change once you become a mother. And um, mm -hmm. I thought about it. I said, her name was Bobby. Bobby, that is narcissism. Who ever heard of a film about a private person? Because until then, documentaries were about public figures, whether it's political, criminal, mm -hmm. famous people. But nobody had made a camera about a private life, especially a woman having a baby. But I thought, you know, this is a, not a bad idea, but I don't want to do this that suggestion. I'm going to do a film about mm -hmm. the conflict between parenting and working. And I got... Oh. 
money from $10,000 from public, public television uh, in New York, WNET, and made this film that's a half hour long that actually starts with me giving birth on camera. And it was the first live birth ever seen on television. I, I, and uh, it was so unique that it was, in, it was, it's now in the Museum of Modern Art because nobody, <laughs> nobody had ever done a film. And now there, I, I feel like I've given birth to thousands of people's movies about their grandmothers, their sisters, their cousins. It's all about them. But this was totally original. And I've scouted mm -hmm. the internet trying to see if, if I am indeed the first. And so far, I, I think I am. But I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still popular today. The, nothing's changed. That the question of who takes care of the child is still a burning question for people. It is. Unfortunately, it is indeed. Um, your, your daughter remarked, I think, how many thousands or millions of people have witnessed her birth? You sharing I, it. I, I, have a, I have a joke. It was shown last week at a film forum in New York in, in connection with the book. And I always say, Sarah, you were born again in New York. <laughs> because she <laughs> thinks, you know, it's, it's, yeah, she's, to her, it's normal. If somebody says, what's it like to be on film being wished, which that's, that's all she knows, you know, what's the mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So you were still doing documentaries, but did you always, did you still have that burning desire that you wanted to make feature yeah. films, fiction oh, films? Yeah. It re, it, it reignited in a strange way. Uh, uh, this precedes the largest This is 1965. And uh, I yeah. wanted to do my own film and I couldn't figure out a subject. And I got a call out of the blue from uh, a cousin's husband who was a, I was told a hotshot Hollywood agent. I never met him. And he called me one day um, and he said, uh, I'm now representing a group, a, a young music. Oh, the Beatles had just come out. This is 1965. They had been on television. Yeah. And everybody was insane for the Beatles. He said, I'm representing a new group that's going to be bigger than the Beatles. And they're recording a, an album with United Artists. And it, I can get you in so you could do a film about the making of the album. Oh, my God. Uh, they were, okay, so much history involved. The actor Richard Burton was married to a woman named Sybil Burton for years. They had children. And then mm -hmm. he did a film with Elizabeth Taylor, Cleopatra. That's and it was yeah. a big scandal. And he left Burton to marry Taylor. So there okay. was Elizabeth Burton in New York. And she opened up a club. This was the discotheque time. And she opened up a club in New York and hired these musicians. And that's how they got agents and all the press they were getting. Uh -huh. because She had all these agents. So I met Sybil and she said, oh, wonderful. Yes, this is a good idea. I'll, uh, and she even agreed to be in the movie. And I went to the first session where they were with the record producers of the album. The producers wanted to hear their music. And I got, it was at the club during the day, and you know, it was just the musicians. And I realized this is ridiculous. They have no original music. And, and they're good, but they're not special. Uh, it was a mess. A, I went on filming because I was there and I was, I wanted to make this movie. And I thought, well, maybe it'll get better somehow. And I finished the movie. They didn't get, anyway, one of the musicians also married Sybil Burton, who was quite a bit younger than she was. Anyway, I showed Sybil the movie and I knew what was gonna happen. She said, if you ever show this movie, I will sue you. Because they, they come across as not, as a little, to put it mildly, naive. To, it's, mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't want to be, be that person in the movie. Okay, this is how I got into features. I was crushed. <laughs> absolutely crushed. And then I got a phone call. I'm getting phone calls. 
from a secretary saying that the head of United Artists movie division, David Picker, they then had New York offices, wants to meet you. He saw this documentary. He thinks you're great talent. So it's because Sybil had sent the movie hoping he'd cast her new husband in the movie, in a movie. So I went and met this man and he said, you should be making food features. And anyway, the story goes on and on. It's through that, he said, you got to find a writer and bring the script. And instead of which I found my wonderful husband, Tom Cole, a writer. And we never mm -hmm. did get to make a movie with David, but I met a great person who I married. So I'm going to bring up a photo of Tom here. Um, your second uh, husband, Tom. Um, yes. He had an interesting life in his own right. I mean, his, oh, I yes. read somewhere his father, his father had served every president from FDR to Nixon in, yeah. in settling neighbor disputes. Yes. Uh, Tom spoke Russian. He was an mm -hmm. interpreter. And he even sat, sat on the kitchen debates with uh, Nixon and Nikita Khrushchev. Yes, he was there. And he was, he was then a, he taught yeah. literature. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go on. You're reading. Go ahead. Uh, he, he just taught literature at MIT. So yet he also, he was a collaborator with you. He collaborated with you, didn't he? Yes, not? he did. Yes, he did. Uh, and yeah. Go ahead. No. We were both married when we met, so it wasn't an easy getting together. And many people okay. go through this, yeah. And uh, he eventually divorced his wife, and yeah. I got divorced. Mm -hmm. uh, so it turned out to be both a love affair and a collaboration. Which is... So what was that collaboration like? That's what I want to know. Working with your husband on something so creative and my happiest times with him were working we got, actually our minds just got together mm -hmm. and i think the happiest time i ever had with him was when we were writing this feature you refer to smooth talk that laura mm -hmm. eventually started mm -hmm. it's just it's just like nothing else because it just flowed very easily um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, as we go into talking about smooth talk, it's, uh, my wife and I rewatched it last night, and man, it still resonates today mm -hmm. in terms of the content. And mm -hmm. you yeah, have these are. two wonderful actors, Treat Williams and Laura Dern, and. It's based on a short story by Joyce Carroll. It's where are mm -hmm. you going? Where have you been? And if you ta tell us how this movie came about. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Well, again, you're too young. To, no, I don't know. There was a series on um, PBS called American Playhouse. Mm -hmm. and this was in the 80s into the 90s. Um, and they they they, uh, they encouraged documentary filmmakers or theater directors if they wanted to make features they were going to give them a chance and supply some money not a lot. Mm -hmm. And they in their first season they produced I produced a play of Tom's uh, called Medal of Honor Rag about a, a Vietnam War vet. Um, and so I got oh. to know them and, and they said if if you have a script bring it to me and I had read. This short story by Joyce Carol Oates, which terrified me. It's her most famous short story. Um, and I optioned it. And we wrote the script. And it was accepted. And I always, I, I can't, I've been, I've had a lot of misfortune in my career, but I've also had great strokes of luck. Uh, I, Tom, Tom and I were living in a small town in Connecticut, had a private school and the headmaster was a fr had been in college with Treat. And, oh. he, and um, so he gave Treat Williams the script. Treat was living in New York. I met Treat. Uh, again, a marvelous coincidence. James Taylor was a neighbor. <laughs> and he came by one night and he said, what are you guys so happy about tonight? And we said, well, we just finished a version of the script. 
You know, can I read it? Sure, if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, he was one of our first readers, I think. And he came back the oh. next night and he said, I loved it. He, he associated with Connie, the young heroine, with her longing to have something special happen to her. And he said, mm. can I do the music? And I feel like saying, no, what? James, you can't do the music. <laughs> And that was just extraordinary. And the way I met Laura is even crazier. Uh, because of Tree's schedule, we had just, he, was, he only could give us a week. He was working for nothing, uh, minimum as actors deal minimums. And the producer who found some more money for us was living in uh, Ross in Marin. And mm -hmm. I was in the production office. We, hadn't, we couldn't find an actress to play the lead. It just, it just didn't click. They came mm -hmm. up just sounding very uh, unpleasant, to put it mildly. Anyway, it was 10 days to go, and we didn't have a lead. And one day, Martin, the producer, was on the phone with a friend who's a photographer down in Malibu, living in, uh, oh, I guess it's called the Malibu Colony on the beach. And mm -hmm. he, he was saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he hands me the phone, and this woman, Nancy, says, uh, I know her, not I know a woman like her, a girl like her. She, I know her, she's walking by my window right now. Who's walking by my huh? window? Yeah, who is walking by your window now? Bruce Stern's daughter, Laura. She's, okay. So I call Laura, who lives in, New, in LA, and her answering machine picks up, and uh, she's not there. It's the days of answering machines. And it's playing a song that's in the script, James Taylor's Handyman. I'm oh. your handyman. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. Okay, this is a wonderful omen. So we, we arrange, finally she calls me back and we, I go down. She picks me up at Burbank Airport. We go to a studio. I was going to record an audition to send to Tom, our producer, Martin. And I get in her car. Her uh, stick shift is a postcard of James Dean. It's not just any old postcard of James Dean. It's the one that was already being designed to go on the wall of this, our young heroine. Exactly the same photo. It was scary. And, you know, what are these coincidences? Anyway, she was marvelous. Wow. Like, like Joan Baez, she just opened her mouth and started reading. And, you know, I said, you're cast, you know. And that's how I met Laura. She was... Just almost 17. Yet, years later, you're still very good friends. Yeah. That's what I find the most remarkable thing. Well, she came to stay with us in Connecticut very often. She was then yeah. li living with the actor Kyle McLaughlin. And uh, okay. they both came. And we went to Venice on a vacation together. Yeah, we've had some... I was very lucky with, and Treat's still a friend. Every once in a while, the phone mm -hmm. will ring and it'll be Treat and he'll say, oh, the name of the character was Arnold Friend. And he said, hello, this is, <laughs> anyway. It's, they're, they're, that's unusual because you, usually when you work with actors, you form a little band and you think you, mm -hmm. you never part and then you do part and you don't keep up the friendships really. But this is, this is an unusual one. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. it's it's very unique indeed um but you know i think i have to give your husband some credit too because he wrote the screenplay oh absolutely and, and he he actually bonded with laura pretty well here's this 50 year old professor bonding with a 15 year old actress uh the new, I think it's the New York Times, called Laura when Tom died yeah. in 2009. And I, I'll, mis, I'll misquote it, but basically she said, I couldn't believe this 50-year-old professor uh, could, could understand what somebody my age was going through, but he did. It's, a, it's an imagine, a leap of imagination and empathy. I mean, Tom had that gift. Mm -hmm. as all wonderful writers who are putting themselves into that space. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
We'll get back to Tom in a second, but I wanted to ask you, the response at Sundance was incredible. You were the first female director. No, there was who, one before me. Well, there was one before you that won the grand jury prize. Yes, and I didn't know it until, I don't know, five, four or five years ago. Uh -huh. It was, uh, what was really? it? Really? No, there was an, an anniversary for Sundance, uh, 40th or 50th, and uh, they uh, they vowed, made a, pr a promise and fulfilled it that from now on, all their programming would be 50-50 women and men. Wow. It was a big okay. deal. And the Hollywood Reporter picked up the story and decided they would do uh, an article about the women who won the jury prize. And mm -hmm. I was asked to come to New York to be part of a photo shoot and interviews. And I went and they were about, let's say it's 40 years. I can't remember now. I think there okay. were six or seven of us. And that's where I met this woman whose name I'm blanking on was the one before me. Sorry, I can't remember her name. Oh, wow. Deborah Grant so, oh, was there. That's yeah. right. Rebecca Miller. Um, okay. Anyway, it was, it was a good experience. Well, Deborah Granick, uh, Winter's Bone, correct? Yes, is and a few others that are, yeah. Yeah. But what, yeah, it's Deborah. So years later, I've just got to ask how, you know, you were greeted so warmly and respectfully. How did that make you feel? Where was I greeted so warmly and respectfully? Because at the Sundance celebration. Oh, the one. And you mean the you night were, I got the award or when I later on? Yeah. At, later on when you met Deborah and oh, uh, well Rebecca. That, well, I was late getting there because the plane was late. I don't remember. And so all the women already had their hair and makeup done. And uh -huh. Deborah, who I'd never met, came up to me. She said something like, I'm so happy to meet you because you showed the way or something like that. I can't remember the line. It's in the book. You think I'd remember it, but I didn't. I used to know the quote, but it's uh, basically, and I, I sort of was startled because I didn't think of myself that way. You know, when I wrote this book, now all the reviews so far all bring up the same thing about Joyce Chopra led the way. But I never thought of it that way until, I, until people started reading. It was just my life. I wasn't leading anybody. I wasn't. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. yeah. You're, just, you're just trying to get money for the next film or help your husband if he's ill or my daughter or whatever. So you just go on and on. And, on. and I've been doing it a long time. I'm 86. Mm -hmm. but I, so I'm suddenly the woman who's the forerunner. Anyway, and you're, it's, it's, it's and you're still doing it. Too. Yes, I'm still yeah. making documentaries. But, you know, I, I have to think, and everyone, I'm not giving anything away by saying this, but as you read the book, you'll realize that your life was so unique. Your profession, your professional life was so unique in that you actually established some relationships. And I think that's what sets you apart from a lot of directors. I've worked in film for a few years and, you know, I don't get that sense from other directors. Uh, you made a lot of friends like with Gene Wilder. Um, oh, he's wonderful. He was instance. wonderful. Yeah, no, he became a very close friend. You know, and uh, he, he stopped picking roles. He didn't get any roles he, he wanted to do anymore. He was, mm -hmm. was Gene was probably in his late 60s, 70s. So he started writing novels, romance novels set before, in be before World War II. He was fascinated with that period. And he called me after time had died and he said, uh, I'm, I'm writing a novel about a cello playing spy or something like that in Germany. Blah, blah, blah. But can I use the name Tom Cole, which is Tom's second name? Uh -huh. yes. And then not only did that, but the, in the, he, he dedicated the book to my dear friend, Tom, who's been in whatever, something flowery. But Gene was not like, so many people think of him as this crazy, you know, hysterical. He was just like, you know, in Blazing Saddles, he played the Waco kid, very calm. Oh, I loved That's Gene. Gene was very calm, very thoughtful, very poetic. 
a wonderful watercolorist. Mm -hmm. Wow. You've, you've made a lot of friends over there, you and Tom. And I, I have to ask, this is delving away from the movies into um, your friendship with uh, Arthur Miller. Oh, there they are. Which you, and you wrote about in the book, so don't give too much away. But if you can just briefly describe your relationship. Of course, that's Tom on the left and Arthur on the right there. Well, I want to just tell you why they're together. Uh, Some place in Connecticut, Westport Playhouse or something, invited Arthur uh, to speak. And he said to Tom, they were very close friends. He said, I'll do it if you come and ask me questions. I don't want to be on that stage. You know, if you, if Tom said, sure. So Tom is, sets the stage for Arthur and what you're doing now, Tom did for Arthur. Uh, Arthur Miller lived, I, we lived in the country and Arthur loved the same place. He lived there for years and they, they became good friends and they used to go for walks most days when they were living in residence. And I didn't, they were much closer than I was to Arthur. Uh, yeah, but we saw them very often and his wife is a terrific photographer, Inga Morath. Mm -hmm. They met, she was a Magnum photographer and they met when Arthur was doing his Marilyn's film with him. Um, and she had come to photograph Marilyn and that's how Arthur and Inga met. And by that time, Arthur and Marilyn were about to divorce. And I'm blanking mm -hmm. on the name of the Misfits, the Misfits with Clark okay. Gable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Montgomery Cliff. Uh, anyway, wow. that, that's, that's a privilege to have known somebody like that. Wow, that is, that is amazing. I do have a question from an audience member. And yes, I think in your, first, in, in your first, in your first, it might have been your first line, you said about the Bullock's camera staying in the corner yeah. of, your, of your room without you taking it out to use. And why do you, the person want to know, why do you think it stayed in the corner so long? And then what made you overcome that initial reluctance to That's go out? That's a good question. Movies? First of all, I had no idea how to use it because it, I had bought it secondhand and it had no instructions. Um, and it was a big step for me. I, I know I haven't seen the Spielberg's latest movie, but I gather he uses a Bullock's. <laughs> Oh, uh, the Fablemans? Yeah, okay. The Fablemans, yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, he obviously, he was much younger. He, he didn't have any problems because mm -hmm. he could see himself already making movies because there were men were everywhere making movies. I eventually yeah. overcame that. But it, yeah, the reproachful part is that basically the camera said, I mean, what's wrong with you? What, you know, step up to the plate, girl. You know, what are you waiting for? Pick mm -hmm. me up. And mm -hmm. I finally did, yeah. But it's, it's an image that stays with me. I can picture the room. I picture the tripod with the camera. And every day I'd be looking at it. And I felt it was asking me, well, are you going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> I could write a whole scene. And you have. Yeah, it took a while. I, I don't want I'm people to have the, Wait a second, Michael. I don't want people to have the impression okay. that I had so much trouble. It's smooth. It was a great success. I mean, lavish reviews. And I was, in one day, I got a call from Spielberg's office. He wants to meet me, Jim Brooks wants to meet me, Diane Keaton calls me herself. And everybody wants Tom and I to come to Hollywood. And we met. And I had such a hard time dealing with producers there and had really awful experiences because mm -hmm. I was one of the first women out there and we weren't very well respected. And it was very painful. Um, and I just, I want people who are listening to know it wasn't all wonderful successes. It was a lot of very hard times. Um, As you write in your book, I mean, yeah. dealing with people like Sidney Pollack or Hart to Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. It's, it was no picnic for all those decades that you worked. Yeah. And I think readers will definitely appreciate that, how much the level of success you achieved despite having to deal with people 
like Harvey and mm-hmm. and Sydney and even Diane Keaton. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it it was no better roses for you. No, it wasn't. Okay, but here I am. Here you are, and still making films too, which is wonderful. Yes, documentaries. Yeah. Documentaries. Yeah. I um another viewer wanted to know if there was a little bit of irony in your titling the book Lady Director as sure. opposed to just maybe director. Of course it is. Yeah, that's, you know, I, I was, I did a lot of television movies in the 90s and I was mm-hmm. the woman director. You know, wasn't I wasn't a director, but, oh, let's get a woman mm-hmm. for this. As though we had, you know, we couldn't do crash, uh, car crashes or I don't know, it's just, so yes, it's it's my tongue in cheek. Yes, I'm lady director. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you for appreciating it. Whoever That's asked that question. That's neat. Uh, we still got a couple minutes. If you want to type in a question, please do. But I'll ask you. Um, why did you finally decide to write a book? Mm-hmm. A wonderful book, I may add. Uh, I could, I say in the book that when I finish a film, I'm sure I'll never, a lot of people, I'll never get another job. Every, you know, every actor feels that way. And not every actor, some are so successful, they bat away the scripts, but, uh, and I, I'd finish a film, I guess it's about four years ago now. And I was literally lying on my couch, very depressed. My daughter who knows me very well was looking at me. She said, Oh, there you go again. You're going to be miserable and depressed. I know. Why don't you write a memoir? I said, I just, my reaction, like with the documentary about me, I said, that's so nice. No, I'm not going to do that. I don't, I'm not a writer. She said, well, you are taken of many scripts. I'm not a writer. She said, well, why don't you try? So I started with one sentence and then it led to another. And I found, I never thought it would be a book. I never thought I would publish a book. I was really doing it to just not get depressed. And I began to oh. enjoy it. So I just kept get, kept at it, you know, that, that's really. And then uh, I sent the book when it wasn't finished and had, but I sent it to a writer friend who writes memoirs, mm-hmm. not about herself. And uh, she really liked it. And she said, this, you should continue with this. You've got something here. And then she sent it to her agent, who's at a pretty terrific agency, the Wiley Agency, and they represent so many great writers. And the agent there really liked it. She took it on. And she's the one who found City Lights. Which is a a wonderful, it's a great match. And I'm honored you to be part of that world. You were you were singing the praises of your editor before we were on camera. And if you can uh, who is your editor again? Her name is, she's the publisher as well. Oh, Her wow. Her name is okay. Elaine Katzenberger. And okay. She's told, I, I, early on, I said, how did you get to work at City Lights? And she was a college dropout. She went to San Francisco from Connecticut. She grew up in mm-hmm. a town very close to where Tom and I and Arthur Miller lived, Roxbury. And she made her way to San Francisco she slept in parks, she told me. And mm. she, I don't know how she got to City Lights and she got some low level job. This is Ferlinghetti, and this goes back quite a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and she's been there for years and years. And she was basically mentored by him and a woman whose name I don't know, who was also running it with him. And now she's running the whole thing. And she edits some of the books, but she's, um, she helped me. I had, it's so easy. I have so many stories to tell, but, and I wrote so many of them, but they get in the way of the main uh-huh. story. And so it was hard to do, but I cut bunches of stuff and she would press me to write more about other things. She just knew when to push and when to, to the hold back. Mm-hmm. So bravo to Elaine. Wow, that's great. Bef- before we go, is there a little story you want to share that didn't make it into the book? 
because you got I'm some great stories. I started to tell you, and I, if, if you don't mind, I'll go back to it. Uh, okay. That I know the I know Santa Barbara a little bit because I did a, a fiction film with Bradley Cooper when he was unrec. You know, he's still a very young actor. What? <laughs> uh, and oh God, I can't remember the actor. It was. Uh, called The Last Cowboy for Hallmark Channel. And there was very little money. We couldn't all go to Texas, which, would, which was where it was set. And it was set on a ranch. So I went location scouting because I knew there were so many ranches east of uh, uh-huh. Santa Barbara. Gorgeous country. And I went to uh, real estate agents. I went to town hall saying, do you know of any ranches that are not super modernized? Where they, where they would let us film, and I couldn't find one. I was, I was scouting that area, I would say, for two or three days, getting absolutely nowhere, and I was on my way back to L.A., and I suddenly said, oh, my God, the Sedgwick's lived here. Uh, <laughs> it was, and indeed, I can't remember the name of the ranch, because they, but uh, uh, it, it, it's, the Sedgwick family is known really for the youngest daughter, Edie Sedgwick. Yes. Next to oldest was a boyfriend of mine when I was running this folk music club because he was a client, a client, a, a patient. I was about to say. He, he was a, a coffee drink. He came there. So I knew all about this family, which is a very troubled family. And anyway, I got there and it was exactly as he describes. They had a very dominating father and he, who was called the Duke. And there was, and he was a sculptor. And right there is a huge sculpture of the Duke on horseback. You just look at it and you can see why his sons would feel insignificant. He's magnificent. And he, anyway, so uh, this is a wonderful book. It's written by Alice Sedgwick, just came out. So I recommend that. Yes, as it turns out. Thank you. about Andy. Yeah, Yeah. it's a, it, yeah, it's a highly recommended for. It also has a lot of Santa Barbara history. In it. Yes, yes, and they they donated they donated the family the parents donated the ranch to uh, Santa Barbara UC Santa Barbara. Yes, and, yeah, yes. he was very involved with that. So the papa had some good sides. Yes, yes. Well, Joyce Chopra, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was a wonderful talk. We really appreciate you coming on to Chaucer's Books. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And goodbye to my audience. (laughs) Okay, bye. Please remember to buy Lady Director Adventures in Hollywood, Television, and Beyond. And I'll leave you with this lasting image at the end and wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you and good night.